We signed the, the letter to the court, the amicus brief alongside a, a, a long list of companies uh, because we, we saw the immediate effects of the, the travel ban, uh, as we call it, that the, the executive order that President Trump, he issued. Um, and suddenly it brought a lot of uncertainty uh, to our employees. Uh, I was in a conversation with my co-founder and, and I asked have to ask him about like where was he actually born because I knew that could potentially have an impact on his ability to travel. I think we all realized that that travel ban was not something that anybody could be proud of. It made our employees uncomfortable uh, and it made, it made it hard for their colleagues to how to help them, you know, how to what do you tell somebody when your country has suddenly made them uncertain about do they feel supported by this country? So we signed that brief and, and are proud to be part of those companies. I think that that brief, that executive order, definitely uh, doesn't reflect how we or a lot of other companies want to see how, how, how want to want to treat our employees or want to treat people in general. We think about the market, we think about the world as a global market, and the more we can work together, the, the easier it is for us to work here in Singapore, in Tokyo, in Bangalore, in Melbourne, everywhere where we have offices, that we can hire great talent and that we can service the countries that are, the companies that are in those regions. I guess the logical next question is why the Philippines? I mean, and I want you to talk me through the, all the business considerations because I'm thinking here on the one hand, it can't have been just the fact that there's a large pool of talented, skilled English speaking workers here, because if that weren't the only case, then why not India for that matter? With so many things, when you build a fast-growing startup, everything is not according to a master plan that you had when you set out to build a company. And why we actually initially came to the Philippines and came to Manila, which is more like five years ago originally, is a little bit of a coincidence. Uh, but it turned out to be a really good place. And you know, like some of the best things happen by coincidence. A lot of love affairs start like that. Um, and we, we got into a little bit of a love affair with Manila. We hired some great people here. They built a great culture and they became incredibly engaged with our customers um, and we could hire some great talent and, and we've just been working on that and continue to evolve that so we now have an, an office here with more than 100 employees and we continue to invest in the area. I don't have the dollar amount but like we are this office we can at least double the team here so we hope to have it for at least a couple of years maybe um, but we like we have as a company, we have high growth projections. We want to be a billion dollar revenue company by 2020, and that growth will also be reflected in our presence here in Manila. This then makes the Philippines just the fifth office in Asia Pacific, and in fact, the global customer service hub for Zendesk. What's the long-term goal here? Yeah, I think it's important for us to continue to be a full-fledged office, so that it's not just about customer service, but it really is about uh, uh, having talent in product, having talent in engineering, having talent in technology operations, having talent in sales, because that way we can be a better partner for our customers here um, and we can especially be a better part of the Manila tech community, which we really uh, want to be. How we think about it, it's, it's all about relationships. And by the end of the day, it's all about relationships, whether you are a fast-growing startup or you are an airline or you are a, a food processor, if you will. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's ultimately, it's all about relationships between that brand and its customers. And that's what we focus on, the things that are similar rather than things that are very different. The Zendesk is a listed company, of course, not just in, on any boards, but in fact on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, walk me through the difficulties of reconciling the demands of the shareholders vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the company's organic expansion plans? Well, I think that we took the company public almost three years ago, and, and that was a tough process. It's not easy. It's a lot of work. Uh, but I think it's also it's a maturing process. It helps you take the company to the next stage. Uh, it brings a lot of discipline, brings a lot of discipline to the company. And I think if, if we hadn't gone public, if we hadn't had the, the cadence of quarterly results, we would have needed to invent something else that kept the discipline in the organization. So I, from my point of view, I see it very much as a positive thing, something that took the company to the next level. Uh, and I, I, really, I really continue to enjoy it. You guys have uh, made a big point about partnering with local NGOs. In this case, you're with Hands On Manila. Talk me through why CSR is such a, a core part of the brand positioning. We think very much that our customers have to think about us as, as somebody who care 
and by we can show that by the way we invest in our communities and and we think that makes us a better company we think it makes our employees smarter that we can take them a little bit out of their comfort zone and not just sit here and work with smart software but we can take them out and help building a daycare or help uh, you know scholars get through their school and so on so we think those are some of the things that makes us smarter and we think it's it's uh, we think it's, uh, it, it reflects well in the company and reflects well in what we want to do.